Here's a segment from a recent Gun Talk radio episode. You can listen to all the Gun Talk radio podcasts however you tune in, or check out guntalk.com for more. But I do want to talk about a, a subject that I find to be very important. We have 8.4 million new gun owners this year, people who bought guns almost entirely because they were concerned with their personal safety. With They, they want to be safe. They're, they're worried. They're, they're looking at the news and they're seeing the news about riots and defund the police and crime. And it's like, honey, we, we, we might want to buy a gun. And now they don't know anything about them. They, they got a gun. That makes all the crime go away. It makes all the bad guys go away, right? <laughs> Not so much. <sighs> and for those who have been owning guns forever, and somehow think that qualifies them, I've been hunting all my life. Yeah, means nothing. One of the guys I go to about this is a guy who truly has been there, done that. Lots of law enforcement experience, SWAT team leader and everything else. He has a term for this tomfoolery, but we can't use it on radio. Dave Spaulding joins us right now. Hey, Dave, how are you? Good, Tom. How are you doing? I am well. Happy New Year. And uh, as we drive into 2021, a lot of people saying we've never seen anything like this before. And I'm thinking, yeah, that just means you're not old enough to have much of a memory of stuff like this, right? That is absolutely correct, because, you know, history tends to repeat itself, and this kind of thing has happened before. It has, and, you know, we, we've been through a lot of stuff. I, I also, one of my pet peeves, and it bounces off of you, just get to get us started here, is when people say, well, you know, I just can't imagine ever, or I can't imagine this, and I always respond with, well, you just need a better imagination. And that's when I go to people like you who have been cops career law enforcement people, because you don't need an imagination. You have seen it out there. And when I get to talk to people like you, I go, holy cow, there are some weird people and there are some bad people out there. Fair enough? No, exactly. I, I, I'm not sure that the general populace truly comprehends the evil that man is capable of. What do you mean? Well, the evil that men do can be extreme. Um, just uh, think about some of the things that uh, the criminal element has done to children. I mean, just mm. just look at the human trafficking problem around the world and the, the stuff that is done to, to children and females in and, and various parts of the world. Uh, a lot of people don't give that kind of thing thought, but, but mankind can be quite evil, can be quite dastardly. And uh, it's um, at times incomprehensible, and I'm not sure that people really want to know. Ah, there's that. And I've always said a lot of this is a protective mechanism of if I can pretend it doesn't exist, then I don't have to think about it because it's horribly discomforting to think about it. And so, therefore, I will just pull this little bubble cocoon around me, and it's like sticking your fingers in your ears and going, na, 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 I can't hear you. Yeah, the, the ostrich effect, you know, putting your head in the sand and making, you know, acting like it doesn't yeah. happen. But it, but it does happen, and, and the problem is, is it happens to people whether they want it to or not. And it pops up when you least expect it. Uh, I, my phrase for that is, there's a lot of crazy out there, and it's everywhere, and it may be turning the corner right in front of you right now. Bad things happen to good people in nice places. Uh, I, I mean, just... Understand that right up front, you'll be better off. What is, when people come to your class? Because I mean, you're well known, and you develop. You really have a great training curriculum. Generally, they know stuff. They have some level of knowledge. I assume when they come to you, you probably don't get a lot of first timers. But what do you find that people routinely don't understand about self defense with guns? Well, I'm, I am blessed in the fact that I, I teach at a level that when people come to my classes, they realize already that they are potentially in jeopardy and they need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. That is a big step forward as far as dealing with my, with my students. Now, the thing that they don't comprehend is what evil really is. Most of it is, is based on television or the movies or things right. they've heard. They really have never seen what it's like for someone to um, dismember someone or put a child in a microwave oven 
or uh, some of the some of the many things that I've seen in my life. And you can try to explain things like that to them, but they really don't comprehend it because they they've never grasped it. And unfortunately, when these people do see these type of things or they do experience this extreme level of evil, they're not capable of responding to it, even if they are trained. Well, isn't that what a fair amount of the training really accomplishes is trying to reduce whatever you call it, the reactionary gap, the time period, the recognition factor? First of all, you've got to believe that it's real, that it's out there. If you can't get to that point, you can't even recognize what's going on in front of you. Well, exactly. That, that's what I call the combative application of the handgun. There's a competitive application and a sporting application and all various things. But if you're talking about true combat, mm-hmm. it's not about how fast your splits are or how tight a bullseye you can shoot or how fast your draw is. It's the true comprehension of what you are facing, what your opponent is going to do to you if you fail, and doing whatever it takes not to survive but to prevail, to go home both physically and psychologically as you were when you left the house. And that is probably the most difficult aspect to get across to students when you're trying to teach this type of pistol craft. Dave was the, listed as the National uh, Law Enforcement Trainer of the Year a few years ago. Been there, done that, led SWAT teams into buildings, done all this kind of stuff. When you, you mentioned surviving emotionally, what do you mean? Well, you know, you look at the number of our combat veterans that are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan that have committed suicide. And Mm. so often those are due to post-traumatic stress because they are just overwhelmed by the experience they had. The same thing can happen to law enforcement officers, can happen to armed citizens. So not only do you have to prevail in the situation, you have to prevail in the legal aspect, and you have to prevail in the psychological war that some people face. Not everybody does. Some people Mm -hmm. are very well adjusted, but others are not. So they have to be able to to return to their life uh, psychologically the same way as they were before the incident happened. In terms of people who are deciding, I'm going to carry a gun, what gets them from that to being competent at, at whatever level that is? What do people need to do to move from, I bought a gun and I now have a a carry permit, and I have a holster to being actually, number one, safe, but also being ready and competent. What, what, do, we, what do they have to do? Well, the CCW permit holder, first of all, going through their permit class, and that varies from state to state, that's just putting your toe in the water. You're just putting your toe in the puddle. Uh, mm-hmm. You're learning how to, to use that gun and understand the safety. And the People that teach these classes are absolutely invaluable to the gun community because they get so many of these people started. Right. But that is just the beginning. The way I view combative weapon craft, whether it's a handgun, a carbine, or a shotgun, is it occurs at three levels, and all three of these levels have to be addressed, and it's like a pyramid. With the foundation of that pyramid being what I call the essentials, some people call them the fundamental. I hate the word fundamental because I don't think it gives the importance to those skills that they're due. These skills are essentials. You need to know how to grip, how to work the trigger, how to use the sights or not use the sight, depending on the circumstance, how to draw from the holster, how Mm -hmm. to manipulate it. You need to do it in a way that is due rest filled, because that's the environment you'll be doing this stuff in. Mm -hmm. But once you get those essential skills and you've got them to a level where you won't be totally on automaticity, but you truly understand how to use them. You then got to deal with the combative aspects. And so now we're inserting the use of one hand, you know, shooting from unconventional positions in case you get knocked on your butt right. in the middle of your gut fight. You know, how to, how to recognize cover versus concealment and not just use it, but find it. Because, you know, so often people will say, well, in a gunfight, use cover. Well, think about that for a minute, Tom. Mm-hmm. Rounds are going back and forth past you. 
and you're going to stop in the middle of that, and you're going to look around and try to right. diagnose work. No. So now we're talking about movement, but not just movement, movement with purpose, the type mm-hmm. of movement that will keep you in the fight, that will make you accurate. But we don't stop there because once we got a good handle on the combative aspects of this, then we have to add the interactive aspects to it. And that's not just force-on-force training, not just, you know, UTM or or airsoft scenarios. Mm -hmm. There are so many other things that can be addressed in interactive training that aren't, like moving in and around other people with a loaded gun. You know, you do that on a hot range and people will melt down. Mm-hmm. You know, we, you know. Once before, we were talking about the drill I do, where we check 360, where you literally turn up range with a loaded gun in your hand to scan for other threats. Well, you know, I've been to a lot of places that melt down when you try to do that, <laughs> but you can do that in the interactive arena. Um, you can do a lot of judgment-related training that has nothing to do with playing out a scenario. I, I don't think that we do the interactive aspects of combative pistol craft as well as we can. Hey, Dave, hold that thought. I need to take a quick break here. We want to pick this up on the backside. We're talking with Dave Spaulding, handguncombatives.com. How should people practice this stuff, assuming they've gone to a class and they've taken, gotten some training and they, they're starting to understand this stuff? It's not just a case of throwing rounds down range, is it? No, there's a, there's a format, there's a process to this. Um, it's my opinion that the vast majority of combative pistol craft, pistol craft skills can be practiced dry fire in your oh. basement or, or a room, you know, where you're by yourself and you can focus on it. You know, mm-hmm. these laser trainers and airsoft guns and things like that are, are great training aids. If you really think about it, the only thing that really requires live fire is, is, Recoil control and, and, and trigger action, okay. where you, you depress the trigger, the, the gun fires, you reset it while you're recovering and recoil to follow through to get back up on it. There's no real way to simulate that other than to shoot the gun. Right. But I see people all the time that say, well, you know, the only range near me is, a, is an indoor range, and they won't let us draw from the holster. Okay, well, go in your basement or go in your bedroom and practice drawing from the holster. Yeah. You know, use the airsoft gun or the laser simulator or the Mantis device or whatever you got, right. and use that to develop your draw stroke. You know, you don't need to have live fire to practice stoppage clearances or reloads. As a matter of fact, if you're using live ammunition in this current climate <laughs> to practice the reloads, you're not even wise. <laughs> yeah, and you can get like dummy loads. Load up your magazine. Oh, yeah. You can you can induce malfunctions. You can practice doing that. I, I'm reminded of uh, Tiger McKee, who's a really good trainer. He, he said, "Yeah." He says, "I use a blue gun for training in my house." And I, well, I said, "Well, what, really? What do you what can you do with a blue gun?" He says, "I can draw it and I can move through my house, forward, backward, trying not to bump into everything in my house, and just get better at moving with my gun at low ready or even all the way up." And I thought, "Well, you know, that's training too." Sure, sure. I, I like to use my real carry gun, but I'll put a substitute barrel in it. You know, a barrel is just basically a hunk of plastic, so the gun cannot be fired. Gotcha. Which yeah. makes, basically makes it a blue gun, but you can put magazines in it. You can work the slide. Ah. You know, you can stuff like that. Yep. Um, think about you know, taking a knee or shooting from an unconventional position or close quarter shooting. All of this stuff can be practiced um without having to fire live rounds. So when someone says something to me, well, I can't practice that because I just say, no, you can't practice that because you're lazy. <laughs> and that, you know, which gets us to the point of this stuff actually requires work, doesn't it? Yes, it does require work, but it's not as much work as you think. If you can dedicate five to 15 minutes a day you can get much better at combative pistol craft skills. I'll give you an example. Um, back in the days when I was a younger man and my wife and I would, you know, go out on the, and, you know, while she was doing her makeup and whatever it was she w- was doing, that would mm-hmm. be the 10 minutes where uh, today I would work on drawing from the holster. And then tomorrow mm-hmm. I would maybe work on stoppage clearances. Um, the day after that I would work on, you know, emergency reloads or whatever the case may be. 
um, the, the kids were gone and I was home alone, I would clear my house. I, I would I would actually set up a mirror so I could see how much I'm exposing myself as I came around this particular corner. And it's mm-hmm. just it's really only uh, limited by your imagination and and your true understanding of the problem. Way too many people have some sort of spec ops fantasy about this kind of stuff. And I suspect they're practicing things they really shouldn't be. They should be focusing on other stuff. Yeah, there's an awful lot of Walter Mitty in some of this stuff. But I want to go back to the idea of what you could do in your house. And you talk about just practicing your draw. Most people don't practice their draw very much at all. I mean, they just don't. And you can... And you, you can start off slow. In fact, I would offer that you probably should start off slow and just work the system. It's like, okay, one, two, three, four, whatever your, your draw stroke is, how many steps it is, nice and slow, trying to get to smooth where it becomes automatic. And with smooth comes speed, but don't try to rush it. Would that be a fair approach? Sure. I, I'm going to go back. I, a lot of people don't realize I have a degree in sports physiology. Mm-hmm. And when I first started getting into shooting and training, I called upon a lot of the things that I learned teaching people to throw a baseball or to run over a hurdle uh-huh. or whatever the case may be. And one of the, the principles of any of these athletic skills was that you go slow to go fast, mm-hmm. which means you go very, very slow. You get the skill down pat. You you're doing the mechanics of the skill correctly, and then you increase speed. I'll give you an example. Uh, if you've ever learned how to run the hurdles in high school, the very first thing that they teach you to do when you run your hurdles is you stand in front of the hurdle and to put the heel of your shoe up on the hurdle. So hmm. now you know how high to lift your foot, because if you don't get that right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but that's a you know. Think about learning how to throw a baseball. You know, you put the baseball in your hand, you spread your fingers out about it. You learned how to bring the ball back over your shoulder, the opposite foot steps forward. You did all of that one step at a time, and then eventually you threw the ball, and then you got better at it. You got better at it. You got really good at the skill before you tried to throw the ball at full speed. Same with drawing a pistol from a holster. Bingo. Amazing stuff. I, you know, Dave, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, you are generous to a fault. You, you hand out all this information, and all of our listeners are benefiting from it. And, you know, I know they get tired of me saying it all the time, but it is life-changing when you go get real-world training. You come away, honestly, you come away as a different person. Oh, I think it's true. I mean, don't misunderstand. Not all training is combative training. There's some competitive training, and you should seek the training for whatever your application is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a true teacher is someone who truly understands the problem at hand. And I see a whole lot of applications thrown at a particular subject matter that probably shouldn't be. Um, So you want to find an instructor that truly understands the problem and just isn't just copying what other people are doing. There you go. Dave Spaulding, handguncombatives.com. Thank you so much. 